I watched 30,000 seconds of Mr. Beast podcast interviews and I'm an empty husk of what I once was. Mr. Beast is the biggest YouTuber on the platform right now. He has over 100 million subscribers, regularly gets 100 million views, and rakes in enough money to make videos full of expensive stunts. I bought this ginormous private island and I'm giving it to one of you! Elaborate sets. I recreated every single set from Squid Game in real life. And frequent cash giveaways. As much cash as you can carry, you can keep. And if you ask him how he pulled all this off, he always gives the same answer. You see, the way he does it is, he simply makes the best videos. I'm just focused on making the best videos possible. Best video possible. <laughs> I want to make the best videos possible. Best video possible. Best videos possible. Best videos possible. Best videos. Original giant spectacles never before seen better than everyone else. Fucking huge, ginormous, best video in the damn world. It's as easy as that. He repeats this phrase, the best videos possible. Best videos possible. Incessantly in interviews. If you make the best videos possible. Best video possible. All your dreams will come true. If you're making the yep. best videos possible, you'll get all the things you want. You want money, fame, glory? Just make the best videos. Subscribers don't matter, views don't matter. All that comes, everything you fucking want as a creator <laughs> comes from making the best videos possible. Mr. Beast is the best YouTuber making the best videos, so he's the most successful. It's a perfect meritocracy. The American dream is alive and well. I'm going to be criticizing the narrative around Mr. Beast in this video, but I want to be clear that he's fine or whatever. I've watched a bunch of other videos critical of him, and they all have these disclaimers at the start being like, I'm not trying to cancel Mr. Beast here. He seems nice and cool, and I'm actually in love with him. As per YouTube's terms of service, I will do anything he asks of me, no questions asked. Please collab with me, Mr. Beast. Please. Please, please. A little more than a year ago, I decided that I wanted to take YouTube more seriously as a career. The YouTube algorithm seemingly sensed this and started recommending me countless videos about how to grow on YouTube. What if you could double your YouTube views with just a few minutes of work? Fixing this one thing could be the difference between zero and one million views. I'm gonna tell you how to get views on YouTube so that you can start getting more views instead of wasting time making content. This is a popular niche on the platform. Lots of people want to be successful YouTubers, so lots of YouTubers are making videos telling us us how. If you want to get big on YouTube, you need to be making videos about how to get big on YouTube, in which you tell your fellow YouTubers how to make videos about making videos about getting big on YouTube. Take my 10-week course all about how to get big on getting big on YouTube. YouTube, if you want to get big on YouTube. When you watch enough of these channels, it quickly becomes clear that their king is Mr. Beast. They're obsessed with him. A round of applause, everyone. Mr. Beast. I studied the last 20 videos for Mr. Beast. He crossed 100 million subscribers on his YouTube channel. So I just wanted to, you know, say congratulations to him, who he probably won't see this. It makes sense. For these kinds of channels to work, their viewers need to believe that they can achieve YouTube success by following the advice, which means they need to believe that YouTube success is primarily a matter of strategy and skill. Since Mr. Beast is the biggest YouTuber, it must mean he's the most strategic and skilled. He's the ultimate aspirational figure. If I want to be big on YouTube, I need to learn from his inspiring story. Jimmy Donaldson, better known as Mr. Beast, started on YouTube when he was only 11 years old. He came from humble origins, raised by his middle-class mom in a small town in North Carolina, and he started filming videos on the crappy 480p camera of his Windows phone. His earliest videos were bad. They were mostly mediocre Minecraft and Call of Duty Let's Plays. But Jimmy was intensely passionate about the platform, to a point where he had a difficult time socially because he didn't know how to talk about anything else. I do want to hang out, it's just I didn't upload yesterday and I really have to make a video and who am I kidding? I don't have friends. Determined to make it big, he relentlessly pushed himself to make better videos. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, uh, like a video where he said Logan Paul's name over and over for 17 hours. Uh, 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 
when he finally reached the point of monetizing his channel, he reinvested everything back into his content, using that early ad revenue to buy equipment, and then using his first brand deal to make a video in which he gave all the money away. After high school, he went to college for two weeks before dropping out to pursue YouTube full time. He carefully studied the platform, taking note of what videos went viral and experimenting with his own content in an effort to crack the code. And gradually, his channel grew into the titan it is today. <laughs> the titan. This narrative has many conventions of multi-millionaire success stories, a supposed rags to riches rise in which the underestimated outcast makes it to the top through hard work, strategy, and force of will. The popularity of these stories works to convince us that anyone can make it. You just need to be determined enough and hardworking enough and then you too can be the next Mr. Beast. Mr. Beast himself often explicitly says this, that anyone can replicate his success on YouTube if they just dedicate enough time and energy to the platform. Anyone in the world can be a successful YouTuber, and to me that's like the beauty of the platform. Anyone can make it if they just make good videos. If you have 100 subscribers, you have 5 subscribers, if you upload a good enough video, it will get views. <laughs> Shit, why didn't I think of that? I've been trying to grow on YouTube, but it never occurred to me to try making good videos. The implication that success mostly comes down to hard work and skill is bullshit. And Mr. Beast himself has pretty effectively demonstrated this. In this video, I will be giving 1 million subscribers to one of these four small YouTubers. In this video from two years ago, four people with relatively small YouTube channels compete to see who can keep their hand on Mr. Beast's diamond play button the longest, with the prize being a channel shout out at the end of the video. When I shouted out my brother in this video right here, he gained over a million subscribers in under 24 hours. You could gain like two or three million. Like, not even joking. It's so inspiring knowing that this amazing opportunity will be granted to one of these deserving white men in hats. During the video, the YouTubers' channel names are initially censored. They don't get a shout out unless they win. So what's your channel name? No! What's your channel name? Bruh. What about you? Not then, after 33 grueling hours, three of the contestants have dropped out, and the winning YouTuber finally gets a moment of reveal. You can now say your channel name and it will not be bleeped. Zealous! And suddenly, on September 5th, 2020, at precisely the moment that Zealous was permitted to speak his name, his videos immediately improved dramatically in quality. His views skyrocketed from around 80,000 views the week before to nearly 6 million views that week, an increase of 70 fold. Clearly, in that instant, his videos got 70 times better. Prior to the shoutout, Zealous' videos were frankly mediocre, but after the shoutout, those same videos retroactively became great. As I've watched more Mr. Beast interviews, he's actually started to convince me that the videos that do the best on YouTube are the best videos, uh, just so long as you define the best videos in the way Mr. Beast does, as the videos that do the best on YouTube. I've spent up to this point my entire life hyper obsessing over how to go viral, YouTube, 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 making videos, how to go viral. Fellow video essayist CJ the X has already noted this curious definition for the quality of a video. His metric for the meaning of the word better is concretely and exclusively more money, bigger number. That's the point of YouTube, views. When Mr. Beast talks about making the best videos possible, the way he measures that has nothing to do with artistry or a meaningful viewing experience. He measures it through analytics. The best videos are the videos that get the most views. So when he's preaching his version of meritocracy, claiming that the best videos will rise to the top, it's a completely empty statement. If you want to get views on YouTube, you need to make the best videos possible. And the best videos possible are the videos that get views on YouTube. It's simple. Mr. Beast works very hard, and he is skilled at what he does. Since it worked for him, it's understandable that he thinks it should work for other people. Zealous also clearly works hard on his videos. But the reason he's now getting millions of views isn't because of that, it's because he kept his hand on a glass case for 33 hours. A huge part of success on YouTube is luck. It's about being in the right place at the right time, or making a video that the oh-so-mysterious algorithm happens to pick up on. And looking at Mr. Beast's story, his path to success couldn't feasibly be followed by most people. When he says that anyone can make it on this platform if they dedicate enough time to it, 
Most people don't have that time. They have to work. Most people can't afford to reinvest all the money they make back into their content. Admittedly, Mr. Beast probably couldn't really afford it either. Everyone in the world's like, oh, just, you know, set the money aside, put this in an IRA, do this thing. And I'm like, no, I'm just gonna go spin it on a video. But he was willing to take financial risks early on and they paid off. One thing that I like that helped me is uh, you're, you're crazy until you're successful, then you're a genius. Most of the people who are crazy until they're successful are never successful, but you don't hear from them in podcast interviews. In her book Against Meritocracy, sociologist Joe Littler analyzes this idea that anyone can make it if they just work hard enough. It's the basic premise of meritocracy, that the people with the most merit are the ones who succeed. Meritocracy is a myth. It disregards factors like intergenerational wealth, racial disparity, gender inequality, and disability status, all of which contribute to the amount of time and resources resources that people have available. But more than just a myth, Littler argues that it's a tool that is central in maintaining our profoundly unequal society. It is not merely a coincidence that a pronounced lack of social mobility and the continual importance of inherited wealth coexist with the common idea that we live in a meritocratic age. On the contrary, the idea of meritocracy has become the key means of cultural legitimation for contemporary capitalist culture. The narrative that the most deserving people rise to the top serves as justification for the amount of wealth and power concentrated at the top. Mr. Beast seems to use his wealth and power relatively well. He's known as a generous guy, he gives away a lot of money, and that's nice. Again, I'm not trying to cancel Mr. Beast. I love you, Mr. Beast. Take my firstborn, please. While he certainly helped the people who appear in his videos, giveaways can't address the root causes of inequality. And I mean, I don't expect a YouTuber to fix our economic system, but the framing of Mr. Beast's success story implies that the reason he's in this position to be giving away money is because he's the most deserving, while the people he's giving money to, presumably, aren't. This meritocratic narrative also works to shape us into a particular model of a deserving person. Insofar as our system rewards merit, that merit is defined within a specific market framework. It encourages people to transform themselves to more closely align with the traits that contemporary capitalism rewards. Meritocracy has long historical roots but it also has a new face. Meritocracy today is characterized by the sheer extent of its attempts to atomize people as individuals who must compete with each other to succeed by extending entrepreneurial behavior into the nooks and crannies of everyday life. Mr. Beast has transformed himself and his content to perfectly fit the precise demands of YouTube. Every second of every video he makes is inextricable from his goal of being the biggest YouTuber. Like, okay, what makes his videos so best? Apparently, it's that they fulfill a checklist of oddly specific requirements. There's like thousands of inputs, like greater lighting at the beginning has higher retention if a video's a little bit darker, it's lower. When I watch Mr. Beast, what really speaks to me and moves me is that his videos have such brightly lit intros. It's difficult for me to imagine that anyone actually sincerely believes that a video is always inherently higher quality if the first few seconds are slightly brighter, but a brighter intro does make people a little more likely to keep watching apparently. And that's the priority. The two metrics that Mr. Beast cares about most in crafting a video are click-through rate, the percentage of people who are interested enough to click on a video. The idea is so freaking important. And retention, the percentage of the video that people actually watch once they've started it. Just start getting 70% retention on a video. This is very convenient because those are also the exact metrics favored by the YouTube algorithm. That's why he gives out so much money, big numbers in titles get a high click-through rate. 100,000 roses? One million Christmas lights. One billion red solo cups. I just don't think that's sure? true. Don't count. That's why he has such an aggressively frenetic editing style. It increases retention. Oh, yeah. oh. His video criteria have been refined through observation of viral videos, A-B testing, and analytic analysis. He has carefully experimented with his content to determine what features will get him views, and those are the features that make his videos the best. I would just obsess, study retention charts, you know, we'd scrape a million videos, see where the dip is, like if you pee, like how it hurts retention, if you sneeze, like all that kind of stuff. If we you should pee? Probably but when I watch Mr. Beast videos, 
The aspects of them that frustrate me the most are a direct result of them being tailored for retention. In the videos where people compete for a cash prize, he usually doesn't provide a real sense of who these people are, their backstories, their personalities, reasons to care about them. And that's not an oversight, it's a choice. To me, 90% of the time's boring. But if there's a way to do it in a condensed fashion, where then the viewer all of a sudden cares about this person and if they win or lose. Let's see their retention graph, I bet right. it's piss poor. In the videos where he subjects himself to some miserable challenge, burying himself alive or not eating for weeks, he maintains a positive facade that conceals any emotional stakes. And again, it's by design. I'm gonna spend the next 50 hours buried alive in this coffin. I'm bored, so I'm gonna give one of you that hits the subscribe button in the next seven days, $10,000. His videos have the humanity sucked out of them because it's not attention grabbing enough for the algorithm. Mr. Beast has deeply internalized his principles of virality to a point where it seemingly goes beyond his own content creation. When other people interview him, he constantly rattles off ideas for how they should edit him to maximize watch time. If I talk and you cut to that angle while I'm talking, yeah. I cut back. You can overplay clips, I don't care. Or he'll appear in other people's vlogs and be like, okay, let's have a touching moment right now for the sake of retention. Is this the moment where we grab an emotional hug and you no. play sad music? He suggested on Twitter that maybe movies and TV shows should try following his strategies for virality because they're currently too dragged out and boring and it tortures the viewer. To him, retention isn't just a strategy for success on YouTube, it's a value system to which all art should conform. These are the metrics through which all things must be measured. All of life should be optimized for maximum retention. I ate 300 Cheerios, and now we're gonna find out if I'm still hungry. Mr. Beast has molded himself into the perfect vessel for YouTube success. He allows himself almost no leisure. Do you watch films? Do you watch any films? No, I always- When was the last time you saw a movie? For me, what's optimal is to just watch a bunch of YouTube. He says he doesn't really want to hang out with people other than potentially useful to him entrepreneurs. I mean, in a perfect world, I'd love to go hang out with Elon Musk. He says he once taught himself to lucid dream so he could keep coming up with the video ideas in his sleep. You do this thing where you like stare at your hand like 30 times in a day and you do something and then like in your dream if you saw your hand you'd realize you're dreaming you could control what you're dreaming about and I'd like try to like strategically brainstorm ideas. He is the perfect watch time generator. That's the entire substance of his life. He is a hollow shell of a man. I resent him. I know I'm gonna get comments on this video saying I'm just jealous of him and yes, you nailed it. I sort of see myself in him. We're around the same age, we started on YouTube at around the same time, 11 years old, and then we both made new channels at age 13 once we were actually old enough to comply with YouTube's terms of service. Watching Jimmy's old videos, he clearly wasn't as talented as I was when I was 13. Hello, everybody. But I think our motivation in making our videos was similar. We were lonely kids, and YouTube felt like a place where we could be ourselves some version of ourselves. Jimmy often says that he doesn't know what drove his obsession with YouTube. He got hooked on the platform, but it's hard for him to articulate why. Why do you want to be the best YouTuber? I don't fucking know, you don't know. I just Ever since I was 13, I just made the decision I was going to be a YouTuber, I was going to die trying. And like, I don't know why I've kept coming back to this stupid ass website. I would like to think it's because the platform offers a unique level of freedom to pursue my artistic vision. But I'm sure another part of it is that my parasocial attachment to Charlie is so cool like as a preteen convinced me that YouTube metrics are the only way to prove my worth as a person. Whatever delusions have fueled me and Jimmy, we've both kept at it. He made it big, and I... Um... I never went as hard as Jimmy, and I'm happy about that. Mostly. I'm happy I went to college. I like taking breaks sometimes. I like making videos I care about even when they're not perfectly algorithm optimized. But listening to his interviews, part of me is like, maybe if I'd just worked harder, maybe if I just pushed myself more. Just like, don't make your video shit, put in effort. I resent him. Seeing him say that anyone will make it if they just make good videos makes me want to knock him down a peg. His little meritocratic fantasy world makes me feel worse about him and worse about myself. It's not good for us. 
It's not good for me to feel this insecurity-laced resentment, and I don't think it's good for him to feel like he's so much better than me. Meritocracy pits us against each other. It's a breeding ground for resentment, shame, and competition. And I know now I'm gonna get comments saying how fucking conceited I must be to try to use myself as a demonstration of the myth of meritocracy. Like, oh yeah, if we really lived in a meritocracy, I'd be the fucking ruler of the world. Do I expect everyone to just agree with me that I'm so fucking great? I upload like, what, once every two months? And my videos don't even have Carl in them. It's perfect for cuddling. Aww. These feelings are harmful whether or not I have merit. Meritocracy is a myth, but it wouldn't be that much better if it weren't. In his book, The Tyranny of Merit, philosopher Michael Sandel asks us to imagine a truly meritocratic society, an equal playing field in which social, economic, and political success are wholly determined by hard work and talent. People compete to to make it to the top, and the most deserving win. Imagine the people who are worst off in that society. Their problems are largely the same. They're still at the bottom of a social hierarchy and a system of extreme inequality. They still blame themselves. They still experience the shame of not feeling good enough. Only now they're fucking right. In this society, those at the bottom know definitively that it's their fault they're there. That they are talentless, useless people with no value to contribute. That's not a world I want. The contemporary meaning of meritocracy endorses a competitive, linear, hierarchical system in which by definition certain people must be left behind. The top cannot exist without the bottom. Not everyone can rise. I don't want to resent Mr. Beast. I don't want to be in competition with him. I want us to grow old together. I want to feel young again as we frolic through the flowers hand in hand. I need you in my life, Mr. Beast. Please come back. Under the logic of meritocracy, you use your talent and put in the work, not for the good of others, but for the sake of your own success. It doesn't have to be like this. People aren't valuable because they win. People are valuable when we help each other, when we work together, when we encourage the potential in others. We're not valuable because of our ability to contort ourselves into some narrow vision of merit. There's so much more that we can be. I don't want the best videos possible, okay? Give me some worse videos, please. Uh, speaking of worse videos, I recently made a new channel to repost my TikToks as YouTube Shorts. I personally find it extremely annoying when YouTube Shorts clutter up my subscriptions feed, so I didn't want to post them on my main channel and subject you to that. Okay, I'm gonna eat my, uh, Impossible Beast Burger. I got Carl style because the toppings sounded most appealing to me, but I don't know about this inverted bun situation. This is perfectly fine. It's, it's okay. It's what you would expect. Like this video, subscribe, hit the bell to turn on notifications so you don't miss an upload, support me on Patreon, watch another video of mine. Uh, did I miss anything?